the Institute is delighted to be working again with Irish Aid on this critically uh, important agenda. And we're really looking forward to the series that the Minister has kindly agreed to be, come here today to launch. So without any further ado from me, it's uh, my uh, privilege and my honour to hand over to David Donoghue, former Irish Ambassador to the UN, uh, to introduce the Minister and to chair the proceedings today. But thank you all for your attendance. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to be here to welcome you to uh, today's event, where we're delighted uh, uh, at the Institute to have uh, Sean Fleming, Minister of State at the Department of Foreign Affairs with responsibility for uh, international development and the diaspora. The Minister will talk to us about Ireland's development cooperation priorities this year, uh, with particular emphasis on our commitment to uh, the 2030 Agenda. This is the inaugural event in this year's Development Matters lecture series at the IIEA, which is supported by Irish Aid. Uh, the Minister will speak for roughly 20 minutes and then he will uh, take a question and answer session. So um, I, I should say that we're delighted to have both the in-person audience today and also those who have joined us uh, online. Um, a few housekeeping points. Please note that both the Minister's initial address and the Q&A session will be on the record. Um, uh, those taking part online are warmly invited to submit written questions or comments, challenges, observations at any point, and we will do our best to get to them afterwards. Um, you, those online have the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, uh, which you'll see on your screen. Uh, you're encouraged also to tweet using the handle uh, at IIEA um, and the hashtag development matters. Um, we're also live streaming the event uh, and so a warm welcome to those who are joining us via YouTube. So let me first uh, introduce the Minister of State. Um, the Minister was appointed ju just last December to this new role, uh, moving from the Department of Finance where he had previously been a Minister of State the TD for Leash Offaly. He was first elected to Doyle Aaron in 1997. We're delighted to have him uh, with us as guest today. But first, I would like to ask Michael Gaffey, the Director General of, um, the, uh, uh, of, of Irish Aid, to uh, say a few words. Michael. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I think my role today is a slightly unnecessary one, so I won't uh, keep you for too long because we are here to hear from the Minister uh, on, on the priorities of Ireland's development uh, programme and policy uh, in the over this year and the next year. And it is a, a, both an interesting and challenging time, although I suppose you could always, always say that. First of all, uh, to say it's great to have David here because I was in New York last, last week and we are now preparing for the SDG Review Summit and everyone was recalling the adoption of the SDGs in 2015 when David, as Ireland's ambassador, in, in along with the ambassador of Kenya, played such an important role in bringing the SDGs uh, to life, as it were. So it's great to have David here uh, at this at this point. And I know he keeps in touch with the work. So I really just want to say that for us uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs, in Irish aid, this forum is really important. And we are really uh, pleased to have a programme, which we've now agreed for the next three years, of Development Matters Lectures. And I would just hope that this uh, forum becomes one in which the issues of development, the issues of humanitarian crisis, of politi politics and security and of climate come together in the way that we are trying to do all of us internationally and in our programming. But to have a forum like this in Dublin where we can bring leaders from around the world, leaders in development together to, 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 to contribute to that debate. I think is an invaluable opportunity. And today we will hear from Minister Fleming, whom uh, David Donahue has uh, has has introduced. Uh, I just want to say that it was a, it was a great privilege and a pleasure to travel with the minister uh, on on his first visit to programs in Africa in the week before Easter, where we went to uh, Malawi and 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 Zambia. And it was also a great uh, privilege then to hear President Biden talk in such effusive terms while here in Ireland on the work that Irish Aid is doing and on the cooperation that we are developing with USAID. 
So that's enough from me. I would just say, uh, I don't know, I'm handing over now to David or to the minister. No, I'm handing over to the minister. Minister Sean Fleming, <clears throat> you have the floor. Thanks. Thank you all for the kind invitation to speak here today. And is the mic loud enough? It seems a bit louder, whatever. Anyway, um, and I'm very pleased to meet my colleague, Alex. Um, we are good friends for many years, and it's good to meet David. And thank you for the introductory words there by Michael. Uh, it is a privilege for me to attend and be part of the Development Matters Lectures series to discuss Ireland's priorities for international development for 2023. First of all, I'll have to say about my script, there's kind of two halves. The first half is the depressing half, telling you all the problems in the world that you all know. So, and the second half is maybe a little bit about what we're going to do to try and help improve the situation. So if I see all the heads going down, I'll skip the next page or so. So yeah, you can understand. But it is the reality of what we're having to face. Uh, we wouldn't be as serious about our work if everything was perfect in the globe. So obviously, uh, we're the lucky people where we live compared to some of the other countries. So I do want to say 2023 is proving to be another very difficult year for our collective efforts to fight poverty, humanitarian crises, and inequality worldwide. Fundamentally, this means it's going to be another difficult year uh, for many people across the world, first to earn an income, to put food on their table, and to live in peace and with dignity. And many people don't have all those available to them that we take for granted here for so long. 2023 is one of the world's um, <clears throat> more difficult years, and we do have our conference in New York in September for the Sustainable Development Goals Summit and to take stock of our collective efforts for Sustainable Development Goals, which Michael has been referring to. And we have made great efforts on a number of locations, uh, but this uh, has been undermined, I think, by some of the issues that have happened in recent years. Um, at that conference, along with Qatar, Ireland will be appointed as the co-facilitator of the political declaration for the summit. So, Michael, that's a very busy couple of weeks for you and your colleagues, okay? The likes of us can show up at the end, but you have to do the work in, in between and all the coming and going. But look at Ireland have that uh, outstanding uh, diplomats and they will be able to um, work very effectively. And I we have great confidence in the Irish uh, uh, staff that we have out there and I think people are fully aware of that. So look at over the last 12 months, we've continued to grapple uh, with the uh, effects of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And we are still feeling the effects here today and in most countries and parts of the world. And what that shows to me more than anything is, um, I think because of the increasing wealth in a lot of the areas, there's a growing level of uh, um, dependence on each other. It was a time when most countries produced for themselves, didn't do much trade, didn't do much exports, didn't do much imports. And if something happened somewhere else in the globe, I might not have affected them too much. But now with a greater level of independence or lack of independence in terms of food supply, uh, we're immediately affected. And the supply chain, which is a word I think everybody knows about, is now having a tremendous negative impact when we have difficulties on supply chain. Something we wouldn't have experienced in previous uh, decades decades, but it's very much there. So food and energy prices worldwide remain elevated, and the spread of conflict and violence and sudden weather events, which is most important, are causing uh, serious problems to the people who are already most vulnerable in the world. And the end result is devastating. People are starving, malnourished, and we know that women and girls disproportionately are affected here. And over 345 million people are facing high levels of food insecurity this year alone. That's a quarter of a billion people or more, which is a phenomenal figure. And it's truly scandalous that we're in this situation uh, and at this stage. I witnessed firsthand uh, the human effort uh, and the effects of global shocks during my visit to Malawi, as Michael has already mentioned. In February, Cyclone Freddy shattered the lives of many rural communities out there and 800,000 people were had to flee their homes um, in a country that was already suffering development challenges. And I came away from that trip with a profound appreciation of the resilience of the rural communities and the strength of women and girls in particular. And what I will say about that trip to Malawi, um, I was really taken aback by it. Um, my first day 
I, I actually, before I left, my wife said, what's my life we like? I said, you know, I think of like Ireland maybe 60 or 100 years ago. You know, just put that in your head and that's what it's like. So I phoned her back on the second night there and I said, what to, I said to you before I left was wrong. It's like Ireland before the famine. So it is like Ireland before the famine. People had maybe three acres of land that they were digging, you know, by hand with shovels and spongs to grow potatoes. And some, um, some trader in the local town would come and buy their produce and they depended on that trader uh, for their entire income. It was uh, almost at subsistence level. And what really struck me in Malawi, I didn't see a single tractor, not one single tractor in a whole country that's living and producing food. And that is like Ireland was before the famine. I came back and we've all seen the, the pictures of Ireland in the famine. That is Malawi today, one of the poorest countries in the world. So we really, really have a long way to go. But Irish aid is helping in enormous um, ways out there. And I'll just give you one particular example. We have a social cash transfer. So despite that, I have great faith that we can almost jump, not just a generation in terms of development, but maybe a century in, you know, in a relatively short period of time. And that social cash transfer is administered to our embassy. And where it means we went out to a particular village and I think there was, I think about 15,000 people had a little card, bank card, so it's a master card. They bid and got the contract to give the cash. And the people in the most remote area, we were able to put money into that for them every single month directly from Ireland through the Irish Embassy. It was roughly a couple of hundred euro a year we were giving them, which was equivalent of a couple of months income for, a house, for their houses. And it went to one house. She was a lady and she, the husband had died during COVID and she had six children in school and she was most grateful. And she said she was keeping that money for school fees. So even in the midst of all that, she knew she had to educate her children, but fees were involved. And when I looked at that cash card in operation, they could bring the card to the local, a bit like a mini credit union, and they were able to bring the card up. And I sat with some of the officials who were volunteers doing the processing work, and they were able to pay a bill if they had a bill to pay of, you know, in the local shop. They were able to put money aside for saving or they were able to withdraw cash there and then. So it was a remarkable situation that they were able to do that in a country where only 10% of the houses have electricity to start with. So it just shows you um, how new technology can actually help in a country like that. And I say that as an example of what you know we are actually doing on the ground. I'm only new to this job, so you can tell me a hundred stories like this that I'm telling you today. But I do want to say they do have an impact on us politically when, when we do see that. And what's interesting about Malawi is that our aid, our, our Irish aid programs are generally done through the NGOs, very big, well-established NGOs that are here and have a massive footprint worldwide, or through EU programs or through the UN. But in some cases, like in Malawi, we were still doing it directly through the embassy. So in a country like that, <clears throat> we had the, I would say 50% of the embassy work was dealing with the project. So they were working with local partners um, yeah, through the embassy, and maybe sometime there will be NGOs on the ground able to do the work. But in the meantime, we we're doing it directly as embassy staff. And uh, it was remarkable to see and the linkages they had within those people. But funnily, I say about some of those countries, they're a little bit more advanced than us than it, um, when it comes to um, issues of, uh, of gender. Um, as I said, in all of these countries that we have seen, that I visit and I spent uh, a week with the president in Senegal as well earlier in the year, the issue of women and, children, women and young girls suffering the most, because we're seeing in a lot of countries Still, uh, uh, I suppose, a very traditional old way of looking at it. And mother and father in the house, they knew the daughter was going to get married and go somewhere else. So why waste money educating her? She won't be here to look after us when we get old. So you had that, and they were keeping them at home to work. And uh, you can see the implications of that straight away. But another way, some of the countries I visited had a greater gender balance in their politics and national parliament than we have here. So on the one hand, we think um, they were behind, but in another way, they're actually more advanced. And I think on all my trips so far, I've met more female government ministers than I met male government ministers, because in those countries, you know, somebody that feels this is an appropriate thing to do, they pass a law and that's the end of it. The next election is going to be 
you know, minimum of 40 or 50 percent women or 50 or 40 percent men, as the case may be. And they can achieve it very quickly, whereas a country like ours, we're a hundred years on and we're in a shameful position when it comes to gender balance in politics, both locally and nationally. And that's something we have to address ourselves here. Uh, we're doing it in stages, but we haven't made a progress at some of those countries. So I say that to you, uh, by the way. Um, also, I think it goes without saying, um, a big issue that we've had to deal with is as a result of the outcome of the, the Ukrainian uh, invasion by Russia. We have 85,000 Ukrainians here in Ireland now at the moment. I'm very pleased that um, I think there's almost 20,000 of those in schools at the moment. There are certainly 20,000 of those people working and many of them will want to work and will want to contribute. As just a personal observation, I see a lot of those people wanting to stay here in the long term. To settle here for a couple of years, the children are in school, they eventually get full-time employment, uh, and then they'll, they'll be on their own, um, as in housing and looking after themselves. And I don't see them all rushing back here in the immediate future. I'll just put it that way. And that's the way the world, you know, when Irish people left years ago, uh, sometimes they never came home. Yes, so um, more so now, uh, this younger generation, they're better educated, their flights, they can come home for weddings and family events. And we don't have the same sense of loss when people leave like we did in previous occasions. So we will have to see how the Ukrainian people unfold. But like 85,000 people seems a very big figure. But I look at my friend, uh, the ambassador from Brazil, we have 70,000 Brazilians in Ireland and are more and uh, seamless, you know, a seamless integration. And we've been very, very fortunate up to now because the Irish are generous people. And it goes back to the famine. We all had to emigrate. Take the, take the ships or whatever they were to leave the country and never come back. So it's in our psyche and our DNA to understand helping uh, people from countries that are uh, suffering like we would have done in previous generations. Um, I also want to say that an increasing proportion of our ODA uh, is being channeled through um, the European Union and Team Europe is very important for us because we don't have the expertise to handle all this. And sometimes it's better to be coordinated at EU level uh, because I think every country doing its own operation, which is very good, but there can be crossover, there can be gaps, there can be duplication. And I think it's more effective to be able to do it better. And I think that's very important from uh, our point of view. Um, as I say, our international partners are very important to us as our the, the other NGOs that we work with on an ongoing basis. And I'm delighted to see our new funding scheme for Irish NGOs got off the ground this year, the Irish Civil Society Partnership, A Better World, and that's very important. And with a budget of 500 million euro for 2023 to 2027, this will provide our partners with the flexibility and predictable funding they need to ensure that their policy programs can be fully implemented. Um, I, when I came into the, this role, um, I met all the, not every one of the NGOs, and I, but all the major NGOs, the chief executive, on a one by one basis, because I needed to do that to get a full understanding of what each of them were doing. And I was struck um, with the issue of gender diversity. Um, um, was very much part of everyone's work program, but I noticed that some of the organizations met didn't have what I would call an appropriate level of diversity on their own boards, and especially representatives from the Southern Hemisphere, and we found that I was concerned initially that, you know, we're all uh, with the funding from Northeast Europe heading down to the Southern Hemisphere, and we need people from the Southern Hemisphere on the board uh, to direct us um, and give us their input rather than being seen just from the Northern Hemisphere. A number of the organizations met had already done that, and I felt this was doable. So I've asked this year in the department um, that this be um, one of the conditions um, for NGOs in the future to receive funding. And I'm pleased that the progress I'm told in the department, a number have already come forward and said they will be able to do it within 12 months. So others say it will take us a second year to get it done. So I'll be very pleased during the lifetime of this government that we will have a proper geographic balance um, on the boards of all our NGOs. And it's important that we do that as well. Look at it, there's a very tragic year um, 
you know, with the various crises, I'm not going to go through them all, but the, the earthquake that we've had in Turkey and Syria and go lost 32 local staff, you know, in Turkey and especially Syria at that time. And that's an enormous blow for any organization out of approximately 100 staff. Their, their families um, were probably in, in buildings that were immediately affected by the earthquake. So it does affect us and our operation and our, uh, and our, um, our support goes to Trokra and the families of those people who lost their lives out there. So there is a difficult job to be done and people who are on the front line like many of our staff and the NGO staff you know are at risk a lot of the time and it's something we don't think about back here but it's important that we uh, make that point and we not just move on and forget about it it is important that we do that so look at the horn of africa has suffered um as you all know from um failed crops over the last five or six years and that has left over 30 million people in the severe starvation um, and at the Nut Nutrition for Growth Summit in December 2021, Ireland committed over 800 million euro to support nutrition programming over the next five years. And I think that will be a very important plan as part of the Global Action Plan on child wasting. And I think that's something that we need to deal with very specifically here as well. Um, also closely linked to the transformation of the food system is the need to address climate change. Surprised it got this far into the script without mentioning climate change, but it's you know it's implicit in everything we're doing. You know we don't have to keep saying it because it's implicit and it's part of our everybody's daily thoughts and everybody's work program. And we shouldn't have to reiterate it, but unfortunately we will continue to do it for the foreseeable future. And at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the then Tishuk Mihal Martin set a target of providing 225 million per year for climate finance to developing countries by 2025. And we were well below the 100 million, and that seems an enormous increase going from under 100 million to 225, but we're committed and determined to achieve that. And I think the figures this year will be about 120 or 130 million, which is a significant increase on where we were just two years ago. And if we continue uh, increasing it at that rate, we will achieve that target. And I hope and expect that that can be delivered because we've given a very strong commitment on that area. I just want to talk about one other um, example um, of where I was uh, when I was in Zambia. Um, um, when I went from Malawi over to Zambia, a different, different country, not as poor, uh, it's a bit like, a bit more Western, there's well off people in the cities and the minute you went outside the speed limits, um, it is very, very poor, but obviously there is poverty in the cities as well, and we helped some programs out there through education, and I visited a particular school called the Linda Community School just outside Lusaka, and it was a school of about 1,500 what I would call primary school students and 1,500 secondary school students. And I met the most enormous, fantastic choir when I went in there um, to greet me. And I would honestly say they would win any school choir competition, not just in Ireland, anywhere in Europe. I think they know how to sing and dance very well out there, but definitely it was of enormous high standard. And it is an example of their ability. But then anyway, we went in and we found that um, obviously there's a lot of poverty there in the schools. There was two shifts, the morning shift and the evening shift in the school to facilitate um, and get best use out of the school buildings. And every book in the library had been paid for by Irish people, um, some by private uh, sponsors from Ireland and some uh, through ourselves. And then in the classrooms, everyone had their, their, their small tablet, iPad to work on because they didn't have books for people to bring and you know, somebody used the iPad in the morning and somebody else would have access to it for the afternoon and they all had their different passwords. So I just said, I go in and look at one particular classroom, maybe it's because my mother was a teacher and she didn't mean to know what goes on in this classroom. So first of all, I went into the classroom, there were 103 students into one classroom with one teacher and that was a good class, 103. And, uh, they, and every one of them had their own iPads and there were about, um, they call the four class, nine, 10 year olds, roughly that age. So I said, and they're studying maths. And so being nosy as I was, I asked the teacher, well, what kind of level of maths are they doing? So I went over anyway, and had a good way of teaching, which you will all know. Like in Ireland, you know, you, there's programs and there's, there, there's elements to be done uh, for each term and you just move on to the next term. Uh, to the next schedule, whereas they had a program that you only moved on to the next when you completed all the work of the 
the, the schedule you were at at the moment, the stage you were at. So some people could move quickly and some took longer, but it mean everybody who got up the line understood what happened before and nobody would be left behind in that, uh, not knowing the earlier stages of the process. So I found it a good form of education. But anyway, I asked the teacher to show me. So I went over and sat down beside one nine-year-old and he opened up his tablet and he was, um, and I'll give you the example of what he was doing. He was multiplying as uh, 6.75% by two and three quarters. So decimals and fractions, he was able to convert them both ways in either way in his head and get the figure. I was quite sure that I spoke to teachers at home and uh, the nine-year-olds in Ireland couldn't do that today. Okay, so that gave me great hope um, in that we can bring um, the, through education people to jump maybe two generations in a few decades. And that's an enormous, and I left the room and I said, I better check this out at home because they're going to be passing it out in 10 or 20 years time, which is why we're out there to bring them all up uh, to the level of income and, <clears throat> and sustainable living and quality of education that we have. So they're just specific examples that I have seen from Irish Aid. And I, I concentrate on the human stories as well as just a macro picture because you all know the macro picture here the whole time as well. So I do also want to mention that um, uh, Ireland was a founding member of Global Partnership for Education in 2021, and we committed 60 million to support their efforts to ensure education for all through 2025. And this was matched by our um, commitment to ensuring access to education is maintained uh, in the depths of the crisis manifested by our strong support for Education Cannot Wait program. And I think it's very important that I think you all know those left behind are those of to come uh, with to look after first. And I know at EU level, I was at a minister's meeting there recently, and we were a number of countries were very strong on continuing those programs, but a number of other co EU countries were keen to help the neighborhood countries, you know, in Eastern Europe. And that, there, I came back, you know, um, more than surprised with the depth of the view of helping uh, countries nearest to us in Europe more so than those left behind. But Ireland and several other countries were very strong on where we should be. Um, I know we have a cost of living crisis, but uh, you know, when you're as poor as the people in Malawi, they deserve it before some of the rest of us do. So I think uh, we have to be firm and hold fast and use our influence at European level to ensure the programs that are in place are not um, the funding diverted to other cases that are all very worthy, but not as extreme as the cases I've just been referred to as well. Um, I also want to say that in my visit to um, um, Senegal earlier in the year with the president, I was there for a week, and he was the first um, head of state from outside of Africa to be invited to the event. He spoke and opened it, and he was there for the closing stages several days later, and he made the point very clearly um, that two things, and as a phrase of use, 100 years ago, we got our political independence. and But even after political independence, the vast majority of our trade uh, was with the UK. They told us what to pay for our beef or our milk or whatever it was. So we're really a dependency. We had the same currency and everything. So we were highly dependent on them. But um, two things happened about 50 years ago that has transformed Ireland. One was our entry into the EU. It opened up Ireland. Uh, and now the rest of the EU are, big, are our biggest trading partners than the UK uh, would be our second largest partner. And the second thing was free education at second level. So education is the key to the future. And that's why I was so keen to see so many projects that I visited firsthand were based on education. Because if you don't, if the people aren't, aren't educated, they won't make progress. And in 50 years time, they'll be doing it as they're still doing it today. And it's no good just giving them the money and equipment. They need to be able to do it themselves. We're, held, we're there to help people help themselves, not for us to be permanently out there doing it with them. So education is most important. So I, I think I will close now at this stage. I've... Um, um, skipped away from some of the macro stuff that I think every time we've met, we've spoken and given you some of the personal experience that I that I have seen. And I think it's very important that um, we don't lose sight of the, the personal stories. And I do believe one of the reasons why Irish people are supportive and very supportive uh, of Irish Aid Project is they get the human story. They don't get the COP figures, they don't get the EU summits, they don't get the global policies but to get the human story. And I think anytime we're talking to an audience at home, if you give them a human story example, everybody gets that. And I think Irish people have been generous 
with their own voluntary fundraising, but they've also been generous in supporting us as politicians in ensuring we continue to increase our uh, funding for overseas aid as we have been doing. And I look forward to continuing my work in this department and to make sure that we make a real difference despite the difficulties that are out there. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. That was really a, a fantastic presentation and uh, clearly de delivered from the heart. And uh, must say, for a minister who's only in his first months in office, you've, you're on top of the brief in no time. And uh, uh, congratulations. Uh, I mean, a lot of what you said resonated deeply with me, especially the idea that we have to look after the needs of the poorest people, the poorest of the poor. It's not obvious in aid programmes internationally that that will always be uh, uh, the priority, but I think it, it sounds as if you will keep it as our, as Ireland's priority, and uh, I must say that that's very, very encouraging. So I'd like to invite anybody who, who wishes, uh, both here uh, in, in the room and online, uh, to um, put any questions, comments they would like to the minister, um, and um, yes, please, uh, Rosario. Is it? Give your full name. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, minister. Um, that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, speech, and especially the points on gender resonated uh, very strongly, both from um, my own experience in the developing world, but also, um, but also here at home as well. Uh, so. Uh, uh, well, uh, well done. Um, really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, uh, Sean and I are cousins. <laughs> uh, oh, oh so nice. the first I knew about it this morning was uh, she missed the first train from Cork, but she was getting the second train out. So, but she's also idea. from the Centre for Global Development yeah, in the UCC. Yes, delighted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm thrilled that a relative of mine is now the Minister for um, International Development and Diaspora. So that's really, really happy to know that. Um, and I, 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 I think it's we've missionaries in the family as well, so it's yeah. probably in the blood. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my comment was, um, um, I suppose, just how close are we to meeting our target in relation to 0.7%, uh, which we committed to. So sorry, going back to the yeah. macro now, because I, I love the micro myself, having spent a lot of time in the field. But just wondering, you know, is it within reach within um, the next few years or how, how close are we? Do you know? Okay, I'll, an I'll answer that um, straight up. And the the, the amount of uh, funding we provide for overseas aid has increased every year consecutively for the last nine years. So we're very, very pleased with that. Then uh, in relation to the 0.7% the target, that's a very ambitious target. I think when we set that target, the, the monetary value of that was at a level that is easily achievable. But <clears throat> And so through our vote in our department, we spent about seven or 800 million a year we spent about 500 million through the Department of Agriculture and Food Aid programs around, brings it up to about 1.2. But I think you will all know as well that under um, humanitarian aid uh, at OECD level, they want people who are assisting uh, people who are coming into their country from a country where they're fleeing, whether it's a war or a conflict or for international protection. When they arrive for the first 12 months in the country, is deemed to be under OECD use part of our uh, percentage to achieve that. So what I will say is that um, overall last year, the OECD draft figures say we've given about 2.4 billion uh, last year. A lot of it, about 900 million of that was specifically for the Ukrainians who arrived in the first year. And the OECD says, look, we're helping the people um, with food and accommodation and shelter, but we're not doing it where they're fleeing from, but we're doing it here. So for the first year, um, we, we were at 2.4 billion, which is 0.6%, which is a phenomenal figure. Now, it is possibly uh, inflated because of the Ukrainian situation, and maybe that was a once-off, um, but the figures wouldn't have been um, that close at all. But in fact, because of Ukraine and the costs we were incurring almost a billion last year, we would be at 0.6, 
but we don't want to be at 0.6 because we have continuing crisis and people coming into the country, as I said, the 85,000 people and the increase in people seeking international protection. So the numbers are still coming from Ukraine, but it's reduced numbers. And some of that will be counted this year as part of the first 12 months. But I think everybody is aware of the increasing numbers um, for international protection have now taken a big leap upwards. So the cost of providing food, accommodation and shelter for those is going to increase dramatically this year. And in fact, I would say for 2023, I don't know or nobody knows because uh, we haven't... Um, Nobody can estimate how many people will come from Ukraine this year and how many people will seek international protection. But it's one of those budgets. It's a demanded budget. If, they're, if they arrive here, we're obliged to, to deal with them under international law. So from a statistics point of view, I would say we were remarkably close last year. The reason we find it difficult to um, get up uh, um, to the 0 0.7 is because, on the other hand, we have so many foreign American multinationals based here whose um, income um, is, is classified as income and part of our GNP. So on the one hand, we have, you could say, some people say an artificially high GNP by which uh, we want to measure that 0.7% against because of the American multinationals that are here. And it doesn't amount to a lot of trade, but because they're headquartered here, it does mean we pay a much, um, um, it's, it's harder to achieve that because of the increase in GMP, and you've all seen that. It does, on the other hand, mean our contribution to EU funded programs is based on our GMP, and, uh, and, and that does mean that because they are here, we are making a higher contribution to the running of the EU because it's based on that figure, and some of the EU programs that we're talking about as well. So at this stage, I don't think anybody knows the answer. It depends on the number of people who arrive this year, but definitely the money that we're giving is increasing very substantially year on, year on. Uh, and the percents, it's often hard to follow the growth in GMP in Ireland because of we do factor in all the multinationals that are headquartered here into the bigger. I'm answering the question, I think, as fully as I can at this stage, you know? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rosario. Much appreciated, Minister, and I'm sure you'll be doing your very best with yeah. uh, government colleagues to to uh, keep a, a forward trajectory uh, later in the year. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Breda Gahan uh, from Concern. Um, what about future investment in health for development, preventing future pandemics? Uh, as you know, health is wealth, and COVID-19 has demonstrated this. Uh, Minister, you talked earlier about a number of the priorities for Irish aid and education is one, and uh, um, uh, hunger, malnutrition, but health, of course, is, is equally compelling. What would you say to that? I, I think for first our first priority generally, obviously humanitarian issues arise immediately. And then in our long-term planning, education has always been important because we've seen the value of it ourselves here. But health then comes immediately into that. And I know I think COVID is officially gone, but there's a lot of post-COVID impacts in many of the countries and they still have cholera and malaria in many of the countries. And we do have programs that we are working with in relation to each of those um, serious health issues. And we do find in some of the countries that we are actually providing support in their health institutions directly uh, in terms of staffing of doctors and nurses and care staff. So it, it, I think I'd be honest and say our long-term view is education is most important because that's for the future generally and health then is our second priority. But now and again, we get diverted with immediate human and humanitarian crises like earthquakes and, uh, and the likes. But definitely on those areas I've just mentioned, vaccination programs are a very uh, key issue for us um, because you have to have children healthy going to school. And that's where we're working at. And some of the areas we have, they, uh, I think I met a nurse in one of my travels and she was doing 2,000 vaccines a week. Like it was just... I tell you, she'd have vaccinated all Ireland if, or if she was here and her colleagues for a few weeks, you know. But one, one lady told me she'd done 2,000 vaccines in, 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 in a week. So they were just lined up. And so, look, we're, do, we're, we're, we're consistently doing that. But I'm just saying all day, the climate issues and the floods and the, uh, and the earthquakes, not to mind the wars, 
um, are making it. It is a difficult year, you know, and we have been set back. Like some of the progress we've been made has been lost in some of those countries uh, because of the war situation. And there's a bit of picking up um, from where we were before. And that's nearly our priority in some of those countries now. Just a question of my own, if, if, if I may. Um, I mean, Irish aid covers both humanitarian and development uh, mm -hmm. needs. Do you think it'd be possible to kind of keep a, a, a balance between the two over the next few years? Because the, the number of humanitarian crises is yeah. proliferating uh, and we, we have to address those needs as well. But on the other hand, uh, it's equally important to to keep long sort of medium to long term development clearly at, 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 at the forefront. Yeah, that, that's good. That's a good question. And the answer to that is it depends because we don't know what's going to happen next month or next year. However, what I will say is one good thing we have started doing this year, and you will all know this through the NGO, we're now doing um, multi-annual funding. So people can now, they're not coming year by year by year. So the value of multi-annual funding is for those NGOs when we say, here's funding for the next three, four years, we are now being committed once they deliver. So in a way, I would have said to most of the people, and maybe, maybe I'm making trouble for myself in the department, but most organizations should try and have multi-annual funding program because you have certainty, we're then committed. And if it's in a multi-annual program, it's easier keep it ring fenced in there and not uh, have to deal with a humanitarian aid. And I would feel that's very important because it gives you an opportunity to plan, implement, get staff, uh, and it makes our job easier in the department as well, that we, once we're satisfied with a three or four year program, we just have to review it each year. So my answer to that is lock in the money to uh, multi-annual multi programs. Are there questions here? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for your condolences on the loss of my colleagues. I'm glad that it was a relative who asked you a question about targets, because I'm gonna go that direction too. I think everyone in our sector is deeply concerned about the sustainable development goals. I think it's very ambitious of Ireland to be chairing the yeah. midterm review. Yeah. And it's terrific to have the chairperson of that review on the panel today, because I'm wondering what we think we're going to do about the real leg behind on every one of the goals. When we set out with the sustainable development goals 15 years ago or when we did the whole assumption of peace and prosperity and partnership just simply hasn't held so we're against an even more bleak drop backdrop and i'm i'm hoping that between the two of you on the on the podium you might be able to give some some sense of hope for what we will do in this midterm review to revitalize the goals thank you yeah, that is, that's that's another difficult one and what I would say is that um, that summit will be an opportunity to take stock um, and give guidance for the way forward. And more leaders have come to, will reflect on, on this and importantly identify gaps and I, I think and who has been left behind. So we're, we're actually going to that summit knowing their difficulties. So um, we really want to jumpstart some of the programs that have been delayed. So it's not a perfect situation that it's going to be a wonderful midterm review and have we make great progress. We actually already know we're behind. So I think really it's to take stock and try and jumpstart some of the programs. And a lot will depend on, on, on the people who are co-chairing it and their staff to bring people around because I think in all those summits, you'll easily get 70% of people to go along with you but to get everybody else together. And I think that's really, um, the challenge we have. We're not going out at the midterm review from where we'd like to be, but we're going out there from where we are. And I think kickstarting some of these programs has to be our priority. Yeah. To, to what the minister said, Mary, um, I mean, my role was in 2015. I, I don't have a role now. It's actually um, our colleague, um, uh, Fergal Mythen, the current ambassador, who is chairing the preparations for the outcome of that summit. He's chairing them uh, with... Uh, Qatar. But if uh, my own sense, since I follow this a bit privately, my own sense is that um, uh, on the one hand, the 
problems are enormous, as the minister says, every country, and you know it yourself, every country is in reverse, basically, on the goals. And really, it's 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 going to be a very steep uh, challenge to, to make significant progress by 2030. But on the other hand, uh, what is remarkable is the amount of, is the positive attention, the positive uh, welcome for the goals, which still exists at the UN, the, and, and indeed internationally. The phrase used is, we have to build back better from the pandemic in particular, via these goals. Not that the goals are less uh, relevant, they're, they're actually in many ways more relevant. So it is a strange phenomenon, a welcome phenomenon, that every year countries are more and more enthusiastic about these goals, even though for reasons to do with the pandemic and indeed the repercussions of the Ukraine war, uh, it, it hasn't, we, we, we've we've gone into reverse. So I think really what the minister said sets out our, the Irish government's positive yeah. uh, attitude towards it, but it, it won't be easy to get a, a sort of a global consensus around that. Not, I just make one last comment. Because of the difficulties in what has happened in recent years, I think not just on the people who are co-chairing um, um, the, the various aspects of the conference. The UN itself has a lot at stake in this as an international organization. Um, and I think there'll be a strong pressure for the UN to maintain their uh, relevance in the difficult times we've had in the world. So I think there will be a very strong impetus from everybody in, who's committed to the UN. We have to go away with a success here and a practical success, not a, a wishy-washy one. So I, I think everybody will be commissioned to see some real, you know, substance and picking up from where we should have been. Thanks, Mr. Could I take another question? Oh, there are quite a few hands up. Um, um, Jane Ann. Jane Ann McKenna from Docus. Thanks very much, David. Um, I just to go back to the targets, because obviously um, we know that the in-country refugee cause, the Ukrainian cause can be counted as uh, under OECD DAC. But um, they don't have to be. And I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, we've seen other countries show leadership in this regard. It's both Sweden and Norway, you know, have essentially looked to reach the target of 0 0.7 with in-country refugee costs um, being additional to that. Um, and uh, and are also kind of looking at other countries are looking at kind of reporting in a way where it's uh, showing that it's not going to have a negative impact in either ODA targets or uh, development budgets. So I'm just wondering if that is something that will be under consideration by the department to look at um, where to what should be included um, rather than what can be included. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I will say that I think in recent times, most of the discussion has centered on the, the volume of support we're given rather than the percentage of GNP. Yes, that's that's critical, but I think um, it's important that the actual amount of funding increases. So our principal commitment is, and maybe it's just because I was asked the question, I spoke about the Ukrainian situation. You don't hear us saying that very often. Politically, it's a fact. It's how the OECD says you can account for it. Um, but because I was asked that question, I elaborated on that point, but it's not something we elaborate a lot on only when specifically asked. So definitely we're not at the 4% in any event, as is what we would call traditional um, counting for to reach our 0.7%. But what I will say, the most important thing we have to do here and other countries have to do is ring fence the money for ODA and not let any money that's needed for these temporary measures eat into it. And we're absolutely committed. Our funding is sacrosanct. This is extra money we hadn't, and it'll just have to be found. We're all fortunate. We do uh, have the ability to do that. But maybe some other countries that mightn't be as strong with government surpluses may be tempted to use some of those funding to supplement some of their uh, development or humanitarian budget. But we're absolutely committed in Ireland uh, regardless of the Ukrainian issue, uh, to maintain a strong increase in our figures. But yes, when you look at that in isolation, yes, we're still a, bit, a, a good road to travel to the 0.7%. Great. There was another question here. Yes, please. At the back. Uh, Susan Murphy, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Susan Murphy, Trinity College, Dublin. Um, 
uh, huge thanks, uh, Minister and distinguished host and uh, chair, uh, David. Uh, it's great to be with you today and I really enjoyed uh, your contribution. So thanks so much. I was particularly impressed to hear the commitment to uh, amplifying and increasing Southern voice on the boards of our own NGOs and so on. So I think that's a really strong development. My question relates to, I think, one of the strengths of our development cooperation um, uh, system um, that has existed for many, many decades, and that's our focus on ensuring that we flow support uh, through and to NGOs and focusing on strengthening civil society uh, and indeed relationships and partnerships on the ground. Um, we have seen an increase uh, in ODA over the last number of years, but we are also seeing quite a propor higher proportion of that flowing through to the multinationals and probably for very good reason, given the, the macro challenges that we face. Um, so I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit around commitments to uh, retaining that fantastic tradition that we have had um, of engagement and support uh, for NGOs and civil society uh, uh, strengthening um, within the uh, within those priorities um, as you see them. Thank you. Okay. That's a very important policy question that we are addressing and considering in the department at the moment, and I don't have a final view on that. And just to give you my own observations on that, to be able to work, in some cases, we've worked through embassies, we've worked through the NGOs where we can see a program uh, for a number of years and we can see visibility of what happened is ultimately the most desirable, uh, I think, for the Irish people because they can see the projects on the ground and say people can relate to the actual activity. But then there are many cases that it is better to have, whether it's through the EU or UN, working through it as a team um, where there can be greater coordination between because you can't have all the countries doing their own thing and maybe duplication or maybe gaps. So there's a policy issue to be addressed there. I take the point in recent years, the percentage that have gone to those areas has been increasing. And sometimes um, they're able to put a response or they have a, a system in place that our own NGOs, our own department, our own embassies, uh, missions on the ground are not in a position to do in the time required. But I think it's a fair question um, and it's an open question. There's an open answer to that at the moment. Um, and I take your point because if it goes through a UN, we lose a bit of visibility as to where the Irish money ended up. We can say, well, we we contributed, you know, 50 million to something that other countries contributed a billion to, and we are there part of that. But it's nice to see the visibility of our specific contributions as well. So um, I, I do welcome those international bodies are very much in this space now, which years ago, they wouldn't have been to the same extent. And I think that's positive because it gives uh, standing. And like we've even seen in Sudan, the Irish can't, there are lots of countries we can't do things on our own anymore. We rely on EU partners or partners even from outside the EU, even if it's getting citizens out of countries. And so we have to work internationally, but it's an open question. And it's one I think we'll continue to discuss, but there's no specific policy on it, but it's an area that we, we want to be clear where we're heading. Because we don't want, you know, in 20 years' time, there's no NGOs being funded. You know, that's, I, I, I think, a fair comment that some people might say if it continues to go unchecked, and it's very, it's easier, <laughs> right, to check to the UN than go through a detailed program with four or five NGOs in the region. But aside from that, I think the Irish people, um, appreciate work being done by recognised NGOs that people know by name here in Ireland. And there's a couple of online questions here I just like to, to put to you. One uh, from Matthew McGraw. Uh, can you comment on, on the programmes that we might be planning for the Horn of Africa, given what's been happening in, in Sudan recently? In other words, what impact has the Sudan conflict had on our planning for um, assistance in the region? And uh, another question then from Patrice Lucid of the Irish Forum for International Agricultural Development. Could you say something about the role of agriculture in development and your experiences with farmers uh, in Malawi and Zambia? Yeah, look, at Sudan's situation is exceptionally difficult and there's a settled back and any, any area where there are internal strife, the first thing we have to do is, you know, the safety of our own citizens and the safety of our own uh, workers out there through the NGOs and we can't do anything to put them at risk. So that has, you know, and sometimes you want to do something, you feel the need, but it's just not safe to do so. So um, what I would say is some of these things are outside our control. 
and sometimes we can't proceed with uh, projects in an area that we would want to do so because it's not safe to do so and um, members of our NGOs and Irish citizens often need to be uh, brought home or brought to a safer country. So sometimes those issues are out of our control and it's a matter of concern. In relation to the agriculture, um, the, the advice that we are giving um, uh, when it was in Malawi and Zambia, I saw a couple of projects the one thing I saw some of the Irish uh, Irish expats out there who went out there like yourselves years ago, settled there and now are running food businesses. And I saw several of them, um, which was really good. But what I, I would think that one of the messages we give that I, I gave and I took up from um, the areas where agriculture production is poor is they just need a kickstart. Because when I'm flying into Malawi, it's a green country, sun and water. I said, what's the problem here? Before I landed, I said, what's it? What's the problem here? So they have the wherewithal and the technology. So that's all they need. They have the, they have all the resources, um, natural resources. They're intelligent people once they get the opportunities, but they need a kickstart in, I suppose, mechanizing um, their agricultural production. And what I feel is, is a point that I will be moving is they have to work in co-ops. So the message I use in all those countries was that you turned the clock back, I don't know how many years ago, 50, 60 years ago, all the Irish farmers who, you know, when we're selling to England, they, they produced what they produced and they took the price that whoever was uh, exporting um, the thing happened. So they all came together in co-ops in Ireland and, and they're now the Glanvias and the Kerrys and whatever. They're multinational companies, but they're all originally farmer owned and farmer controlled. And I would be saying to all of those countries, true, and in one of the countries I met, the, the local farmers union, the, the equivalent to the IFA, had set up a co-op in a region owned by the members, and they were probably part ownership. So I'm saying no farmer in any of these countries can do it on their own. No group of 10. They have to be 100 or 200 or 300, because it doesn't pay any of them to get a machine or get a tractor or get a harvester. But if there's 100 farmers come together as a mini co-op, it's now worthwhile having the machine. So mechanization is the answer. They need the resources and they need a bit of collegiality amongst themselves. And I would be saying they need uh, to work uh, and set up local co-ops like we did and look at our agriculture outcome. We're an exact example. We're the exact template of what they need to do now. We're almost out of time, Minister, but we might have time for one more question, I think. Uh, yes. And Alex. Thanks very much. Jeremy Wilmseth from British Embassy Dublin. Thank you, Minister, very much for your speech and thank you to the IEA for hosting this excellent event. In March, the UK published its Integrated Review Refresh, which looked at our international strategy essentially uh, at, by taking a look at our security, defence, development and foreign policy priorities. And our Development Minister, Andrew Mitchell, then went, went into a bit more detail about our refresh development approach in a speech at the end of April. But my question is, in view of Ireland's upcoming consultative forum on international security policy, which the Tornister announced in April, whether consideration of Ireland's development approaches is going to be considered in that forum. Thanks very much. No, no I, I don't believe so. <clears throat> um, our, we're committed um, to our development programme as is. And there's nothing even suggested in that uh, to impinge on that in any way. So it's clearly unconnected with this um, area altogether. I can be absolutely assured on that because the Irish people are very strong in our overseas aid. And the other issues are bigger political issues, which I'll leave to my tarnish to uh, <laughs> my party leader. But uh, as you know, there is the, the forum being set up. And I think it's good to have that debate. Some people are afraid of the debate and people get nervous of the debate. Um, but just because there's a debate, it doesn't always end up with the conclusion that people were worried about at the very beginning. So it's important we take stock on those areas where it's not connected to this area. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Alex, would you like to? Just briefly, um, to thank uh, the Minister, thank David for his expert sharing, and thank the Minister for, for being here. And just to say how much we value the support of the Minister Department in this programme here at the Institute, how critical that support is, how much we look forward to working with you, with your officials, and indeed with the NGOs and many people represented in this room. It's great to see so many people here and also members of the Diplomatic Corps, all very welcome. I just have two brief comments to, on the Minister's speech. Thank him for the speech, and as David has said, 
it was it was also it was very heartfelt and I thought um actually a speech that reflected um a real commitment on uh, Sean's part to this agenda and he mentioned Malawi um and I was in Malawi with Trokra 11 years ago and um, with a guy called Pascal Donahue right. as I recall. <laughs> and um it was an it was a very memorable uh, uh, trip for me um, and I really appreciated and you know was struck by the minister's uh, emphasis really on gender in the course of his speech and he came back to it a couple of times which I thought was quite striking and that was something that really stuck with me from my from my time in Malawi the extent to which kind of formal decision making was still very gendered uh, male gendered whereas the real progressive forces you know frankly from what I saw were, were the women in communities yeah. um, and I remember discussing that with Troker at the time and wondering how that impacted on, on their work. And it seems from what you've said there, you know, that has evolved and has changed perhaps somewhat at least. And um, I don't want to, to sort of trivialize the point, but we have a little sign at home that my wife put up on the wall, which says something like, do you want to speak to the man in charge or to the woman who knows what's going on? <laughs> and that was the sense that you really had in, in, in those communities. And I think that, that that seems to be the sense that you picked up as well. The last thing I'll just say, the other point that I found striking from your speech, or from your contribution speech was the climate finance point. I know you've been, you've been, you've been pressed on that. And of course, it's a, it's a big political question, but I was in, um, uh, in Lima at COP20, the one just before Paris, representing the Irish government and at that point in 2014, um, you know, there was huge financial pressure still on, on, on the Irish government coming out of the crisis and so on. Um, but I still felt, and I know the officials I was with were perhaps just a little bit concerned that I was going to say something that I thought <laughs> script. And, and they, were, they were actually right to be concerned. Not that I did, or not that I would ultimately say something on behalf of the government that I wasn't authorised to do, because no minister would or could do that. But it was very uncomfortable. I remember feeling really very uncomfortable at that time that we were doing really very little in 2014 yeah. on that agenda. And it's just so reassuring and heartening to see the step change that's occurred mm -hmm. on that point. Yeah. Now, it's been, the government will say, well, look, it's now easier for us to do it, but the financial situation is, has altered somewhat, has altered considerably uh, since those crisis times. But still, it was... It was deep, and I, I do have a memory of an official from not from the minister's current department, but yeah. shall I say, from his previous department, okay. <laughs> literally running around after me in at, at the COP20 centre in Lima because he was so afraid, was he, that I was going to actually say something. Um, <laughs> he would see me in a hood with Mary Robinson, who was appalled by it, and various other people who were appalled by it. And what's he going to say? Anyway, it, it's, it's moved on considerably. And so, just once again, thank you very much to the minister. Thank you. In particular to Michael Gaffey and yeah. also on to, to the department and to his officials and um, Kate Brady and others who I know who are here who work very closely with us. It's critical to us that we have the support, actually the multi-annual support, to pick up the minister's point. And we look forward to working very closely with you and indeed with all of the people in this room in the period ahead. Thank you very much. Great. Well done.